Maybe your son, maybe the Holy Spirit, that we ask these things. Amen. Amen. Growing up, when I was growing up, this guy on the radio would, uh, there's this guy on the radio that would come on uh, three times a day. His name was Paul Harvey. I don't know if anybody remember Paul Harvey. The, the, uh, he, he, he would start a story in the morning, and they would do a little four-minute Thing. Then in the afternoon, there would be another part of the story. And at the end of the day was my favorite part time of the day, because in the evening, he would do the rest of the story. And he would say, and now you know the rest of the story. So we're going to talk about a story today that's uh, it's actually one of my favorite stories in, all of the, the, in the New Testament. Mostly because of how ridiculous it actually became. And Chuck started us on this a few weeks ago. So this is a follow-up sermon of the sermon that he preached a few weeks ago and the one that I preached last week. So it's kind of like uh, part three. Part three. Yeah, if you, if you missed those, check us out on our YouTube channel. Go back and listen to those and, and catch up on what you missed. But we're going to start with... John chapter 9. So if you have a Bible, or if you have a Bible app, or if you have a computer or whatever, open it up to John chapter 9. And we're going to tell the story of a, a man who was born blind, that Jesus healed. <clears throat> so, might as well get the first part out of the way. And we're going to walk through this slowly, because I, I love this, because I love the healing that happened. But then I love the fact that John chapter 9 I call a series of ridiculous conversations. Mm -hmm. A series of ridiculous conversations because they get ridiculous and we're going to highlight the ridiculousness of these conversations. So John chapter 9 starts off with this. As he passed by, he saw a man blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents? that he was born blind. Jesus answered, it was not this man, that it was not this, that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. He must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Having said these things, he spit on the ground and made mud with the saliva. Then he anointed the man's eyes with mud and said to him, Go and wash in the pool of Siloam. So the man went and he washed and he came back seeing. We'll stop, pause there. We're going we're gonna to take this in chunks because I don't want to get ahead of myself. I want you to understand the full, nest, the, the full impact of this story. First of all, I love this verse because it shows you how much of a man Jesus was. He could have healed this guy any way that he wanted to. But he decided that he could have laid his hands on the guy's eyes and said, see. He could have said, you know, see. He didn't even have to touch him. But Jesus did what, he, what any southern guy would do. He hawked a loogie, spat it on the ground, and made mud. I'm like, yeah. He made mud out of his own spit. You've heard of mom spit, right? What does mom spit do? It fixes your hair? <laughs> cleans anything. Mom cleans your face. Let me get that off. Mom, moms will go, get that off your face. You know, you, you, you scouts know about mom spit, right? <laughs> mom sees something out of the way. She goes, it cleans everything. But Jesus spit heals. Jesus made mud. He said, oh. now, and then he tells the guy, go. Wash in the pool of Siloam. I don't know how far the pool of Siloam is from where he was. But he's lucky the blind guy knew where it was, you know? <laughs> it just makes this assumption. You know where it is. Go. And then Jesus, you know, steps back. And we don't see Jesus again until the end of the chapter. He just... I mean, the disciples don't see this healing happen. And it says, this guy came back to the healing. Came back seeing. 
And I sit there and I pause for a moment and I think about what's the first thing this guy saw. He goes to the pool, he washes his face, he gets the mud off his eyes, probably complaining that this man just spat in my eyes. And he looks and the first thing he probably sees is his own hands. And then he sees his reflection in the pool. So what does he do? He immediately runs back to where he was to find this Jesus that just healed him. But he doesn't find Jesus at first. He finds his friends. And there we have the first ridiculous conversation. Verse 8. The neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar were saying, Is this not the man who used to be, sit and beg? Some said, it is he. Others said, no. But he looks like him. He kept saying, I am the man. So they said to him, now, then how were your eyes opened? He answered, the man called Jesus came, made, made mud, and anointed my eyes and said to me, go to Siloam and wash. So I went and washed and received my sight. They said to him, where is he? He said, I do not know. They said he looks like him. This may not be him, but he looks like him. So what did they think? That the blind man went somewhere, found somebody that looked like him, and sent, sent him back to the place he was? I want that to sink in for a minute. A blind man went, found someone that looked like him, <laughs> and sent him to say, go play me as a healed person. Or he had a twin brother that <laughs> nobody knew about. First of all, how did the blind man know if somebody looks like him or not? You know? <laughs> <laughs> it's a ridiculous conversation, right? That's crazy. Like, hey, it's not him. It's him. How did he know that his friend these were his friends and people that knew him? Well, blind people probably have a better sense of voices. They recognize, recognize the voices, probably recognize the smell of their friends. Because, you know, we all have different smells. Some of us don't like to admit it, but we do. But he recognized that these were his friends and these were his neighbors. These were people that he saw, that saw him every day, that he was around every day. So how did they not know it was him? They're like, it can't be you because you're blind. There's a not anymore. I can see when Jesus comes into your life and changes your life, you're going to tell the story to other people, and people are going to question it. People are going to say, that's not you. You weren't that. I mean, it's imagine hearing all these drug, druggies and drug addicts and pushers that got saved and got cleaned, and they were completely different. They looked completely different. They have a different personality, different being, different wants and desires. They're completely different. And they're like, that's not you. It's me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. I was a wretch, and now I'm a saved, I, I'm, I'm a saint. Mm -hmm. Saved by grace, a sinner saved by grace. So we're going to encounter these ridiculous conversations in our lives. This is ridiculous conversation number one. And what did the man do? He told his story. He continued to tell his story time and time again. And he told his story. He said, I don't know what happened. This man, Jesus, made mud, put it on my eyes. And he said to me, go wash. And I did. And now I can see. Which brings us to ridiculous conversation number two. They brought to the Pharisees the man who had been who had formerly been blind. Now, it was on the Sabbath day when Jesus made the mud and opened his eyes. So the Pharisees asked him how he received his sight, and he said to them, He put mud on my eyes, and I washed, and I see. And some of the Pharisees says, This man is not from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. But others said, How can a man who is a sinner do such signs? And there was division amongst them. So they said again to the blind man, what do you say about him since he, was opened your, since he has opened your eyes? The blind man said, he's a prophet. Ridiculous conversation. What makes this a ridiculous conversation? 
the man is healed, and instead of celebrating the healing, they start nitpicking the details. It's the Sabbath. You can't heal on the Sabbath. That's not the argument they were having. They, don't, they weren't nitpicking the fact that he was healed. They didn't care. They, they were like, praise God, he's healed. They were nitpicking the fact that Jesus worked on the Sabbath. What did he do? He made mud. It's work. Think about that. And according to the Jewish laws and customs, the, the, the extra biblical word laws and customs, construction was one of the things you cannot do in, on, on the Sabbath. And making mud constituted construction. So they, don't, they didn't care that Jesus, they weren't nitpicking over the fact that Jesus healed. Like in other verses, other incidents, they were worried the fact that Jesus made mud. What? <laughs> can you imagine being this blind guy? I can see. I can see you, and I can see that you are idiots. <laughs> you don't say that to the Pharisees, though. They were the government ruling people in the, in, in, at the moment. They were the ruling theocracy of the, of the area. They, they divided the law. They told you what you could and could not do. They, or you should and should not do, they protected you, or they made sure you followed the, the, the laws. So they're, they're sitting there thinking, but he can't be of God. He worked on a Sabbath. He worked on a Sunday. I work every Sunday. I'm standing up here talking to you now. <laughs> so they started nitpicking the details. I have seen sermons and conversations of people who have an awesome testimony, and they tell me that God will do this, and God will do that, and God did this in my life. And then somebody says, nitpicking, started saying, that can't be the way God works. God doesn't work that way. God does not move that way. He does not. That's not how, so that can't be right. God set up the laws. He will follow his laws. So anybody who does not follow the laws of God in the way that we think that they got set up, and that we understand them, then that's not the way God works. So you have put yourself over God in determining how God works. My, 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 my testimony was I got, went to a camp and got introduced to Christ. And I said the sinner's prayer like for the 20th time. And this time I got all the vowels and verbs and nouns in, all the words in, right? And then I came to home. I got baptized. And joined the church. Two years later, two months, two months later after I got baptized, I met Christ for the first time. I became a Christian. I realized that I had missed the whole point of salvation. I had missed the whole point of being called a Christian. I had missed everything. And I sat there on the front row of the front pew of the church. Nobody sits on the front pew of the church except the pastor and the music minister. It's a lonely place. The front pew of the church. Example, nobody's sitting on that pew right there. It's not even a pew. Nobody's sitting up there. It's, it's probably, I don't know why. And I cried out to God and said, God, I missed something somewhere. If it's you, I need you now. And that was the day that I became a Christian. That was the day I really started following Christ. That was the day I got saved. Two years later, I got baptized again. I told that story to somebody, and they started nitpicking my details, saying, no, you were baptized, you, you were saved the moment you did yada, yada, yada. And I'm like, okay, just because that's the way God worked in your life, doesn't mean that's the way God's working in my life. A tract doesn't save everybody, but it saves some people. It leads some people there. A word doesn't save everybody, but it leads somebody there. A tragic event doesn't lead everybody to Christ, but it leads some people to Christ. My God is big enough that he works on a multitude of different ways. Just ask me how Jesus heals a blind man. And I give you three examples that are completely different. This just happens to be my favorite one. So, but there will be people in your life who will nitpick your details. 
and have a ridiculous conversation with you. Which brings us to ridiculous conversation number three. Verses, 9, 18, verses 18 through 22. So, <clears throat> giving his word was not enough. They needed to go to a higher power in his life. The Jews did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight until they called the parents of the man who received his sight. They didn't believe him. So let's go ask his mama and daddy. <laughs> And he asked them, is this your son who you say was born blind? How then does he now see? His parents answered, we know that this is our son and that he was born blind. But how he now sees, we don't know, nor do we know who opened his eyes. Ask him. He is of age. He can speak for himself. His parents said these things because they were, they, because they feared the Jews. For the Jews had already agreed that if anyone should confess Jesus to be Christ, he was to be put out of the synagogue. Therefore his parents said, he's of age, ask him. They didn't trust him, so they went to his parents. They said, is this your son? And they didn't go, well, it looks like our boy. <laughs> they knew their son, right? They knew him from the beginning. They knew him from the end. They knew him now. They knew him when he was blind. And they're like, the Pharisees, the guys even asked, are you sure? You say he was born blind. Are you sure he was born blind? Like finger quotes. Really blind? really blind? Was he really, really blind? Well, when he was a kid, he bumped into everything. Yeah? Yeah, he was blind. <laughs> No, sir, we'd just like to say that he's blind because, uh, well, we got to give him some excuse. No, they said this is our son. We know he was born blind. We don't know if he, we don't know how this happened. We don't know what's going on. All we know is our son was born blind and now he can see. In your story of Christ, and your story of his of your salvation and the story of your walk with Christ, people are gonna <coughs> doubt that you were that person. They're gonna say, people who know you now will never know who you were. And then they'll start saying, Are you sure you were a biker? I've heard of bikers and people who now wear suits and ties and they look immaculate, but they used to come from a drug. And, 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 and sinful lifestyle and now they're the best people you've ever met they're like are you sure that was you I say yes I used to not be able to speak in front of people horrible stutter stammers splurs and splatters <coughs> then I met Jesus and I'm talking in front of you now I'm like, are you sure you used to be the shy kid? Are you sure? Yes. <laughs> I was the kid that was bullied, picked on, beat up, and the uncool kid. Are you sure? I like to think that I've changed, but I'm kind of cool now. <laughs> but <coughs> maybe other people just realized that I was cool back then, too, and they just finally caught up. <laughs> but anyway, people will doubt your story. They will pick it apart. They will say, no, that's not you. They will try to go back to people who used to know you. They will even talk to your mom and daddy saying, is this true? Yep. <laughs> He's different now. And even then, they will cast doubt. But if you notice, it says that the parents were pretty adamant about not claiming Jesus Christ as their Lord, because they would have been kicked out of the synagogue. They would have been put out. They would have been excommunicated. They would have been disallowed to ever come in, and that would remove them from society, remove them from fellowship, remove them from community, and all the benefits that come along with that. So they're like, 
Don't ask us. We weren't even there. Were his parents around? No, they had to go find his parents. The parents didn't see this. The parents didn't do anything. They didn't know. Nobody knew what the heck was going on except for this man. So they're like, ask him. Which brings us to ridiculous conversation number four. Starting with verse 24. So the second time they called the man who had been blind and said to him, Give glory to God. We know that this man is a sinner. He answered, Whether he is a sinner, I do not know. One thing I do know, that I was blind, now I see. They said to him, What did you do? What did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered them, I have told you already, and you would not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to become his disciples? Microphone drop. <laughs> <laughs> and they reviled him, saying, You are his disciples, but we are disciples of Moses. We know that God has spoken to Moses. But as for this man, we do not know where he comes from. The man answered him, Why? This is an amazing thing. You do not know where he comes from, and yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners. But if anyone is worshiper of God and does his will, God listens to him. Never since the world began has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. They answered him, you were born in utter sin, and you would teach us, and they cast him out. A couple things. They didn't believe him. And, and, I, and the fact that, you know, they asked him to tell his story again, say it again. It's like, I told you a dozen times. I told you, and I told you, and I told you. I don't know how he did it. All I know is that I was blind. Now I see. And now I see. He put mud on my eyes. I washed it off. And I could see. Are you guys missing the point? Are you missing the miracle? Are you missing the miracle because you can't get over the minutia of the details? Are you missing the miracle of Christ in your life because you can't get over the minutia of the details? Are the facts overwhelming the truth? And then he turned it on them. I'll say, listen, you guys want some of this healing? You want to be this guy's disciples too? I'm not his, really his disciple. He's not even a disciple of Christ. He hasn't met Christ. He had an encounter with Christ. One time. Right? He hasn't really had a conversation with you. He never even met Jesus, never really spoke to him. And the only words Jesus said to him was, Go wash in the pool of Siloam. That's all, he's, that's all that Jesus has said to him. He didn't even ask to be healed. He didn't even ask for this whole situation to happen. He was just sitting there doing what he was doing, and somebody pointed him out. Did you get that? Did you see that in the story? And now, and then Jesus spits in his eyes. Yeah, and if you didn't see it in the story, we could certainly spit in your eyes. Yeah, so. I mean, randomly, I'm just going to do that one day. No, I'm not going to do that. That's disgusting. <laughs> my, my spit doesn't heal as well as his, um, as far as I know. And they reviled him because he's turned it in on them. He said, do you want to be his disciples too? Are you challenging this? Come on, you want to follow me? You want to know what I know? You want to have the relationship that I know? That's what we do with these conversations when people are asking us and nitpicking the details and reviling us because you can't be a Christian. That's not right. We used to know you. And then, but they say, hey, I've changed. Do you want to change too? I'm different. You want to be different too? I am a Christian now. You want to be one too? Because man, life on this side is so much better than life on that side. Not so much that anything things changed. Not that my circumstances has changed, but I know who's handling my circumstances. I know that I was blind, I was a wretch, and now I'm saved, 
and I can see. And then they started back on their whole religious religiosity. They said, our religion teaches us this. Our story teaches us this. Everything we know teaches us this. And this man cannot be of God because he doesn't go with our understanding of this. There's a big difference between religion and faith, ladies and gentlemen. Your faith is what you believe, it's who you believe in. Your faith is what gets you up in the morning and keeps you going. Your faith is, my faith is in Jesus Christ and in his word and what he's taught me and what he teaches me. Your religion is how you work that stuff out. And so many times we get religion and faith confused. And we put them together as the one thing. They're not the same thing. Because some people have a, a faith. Some people have a great religion. And they have a great religion, and their, relig their faith is in that religion. But your faith should not be in your religion and your religiosity. It should be in the, the creator, the person who makes that religion, who, who makes the faith. Your faith should be in the almighty God, not in the human institution of the church. You just go to church to work it out. And these guys were focused in on what their religion has taught them, not, what the, not even what the Word of God taught. Not on who this man is and what he did. Which brings us to conversation number five. And this is not a ridiculous conversation. This is the conversation we've been waiting for. They cast him out. They kicked him out of the synagogue. He's no longer allowed to be in the synagogue. So he's out there by himself and alone. Coming to Christ does not mean you're automatically going to be accepted by everybody. Following Jesus does not mean you're actually going to ultimately have a family. You're not going to have the old family you used to have. But you got a new one. Jesus steps in and heard what they had cast him out. And having found him, he said to him, Do you believe in the Son of Man? man answered, saying, And who is he, sir, that I might believe in him? And Jesus said to him, You have seen him, and it is he who is speaking to you. He said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. Jesus said, For judgment I came into the world, that those who do not see may see, and that those who see may become blind. We're going to Pause there for a second. That's in the middle of the chapter paragraph, but it's okay. He said, let's focus on what Jesus said to him. He says, you have seen him, and it is he who's speaking to you. And he said, Lord, I believe. We go back to the beginning of the chapter. The first conversation that they have was go wash in the pool of Siloam. The second part of this conversation, the man finally sees Jesus. Which comes first, salvation or healing? Which came first in this man's life, salvation or Healing. 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 And then salvation. Sometimes it's salvation and then healing. Sometimes you come to Christ and the healing never comes of the physical nature, but the healing of the spirit comes. Some God works many different ways. He doesn't work the same way in everybody's life. Sometimes you get your life corrected and then you come to Christ. Sometimes you come to Christ and you get your life corrected. That's the way it works. Sometimes you come to Christ and your circumstances don't change, but your attitude about your circumstances change. Sometimes it takes a lot longer than others. But God works mightily all the time, and all the time God says, I love you, I love you, I love you, I love you, I love you. And he says, I am the Son of Man. And the man said, I believe, and I worship you. And now we come to the final conversation, which is kind of a ridiculous conversation. Starting with verse 39. He says this, For judgment I came into this world, that those who do not see may see, and those who may see 
those who see may become blind. Some of the Pharisees near him heard these things and said to him, So, are we also blind? Yes. Yes, you are. That's what I thought. That's not in there. That was, that was, uh, Jesus said, If you were blind, you would have no guilt. But now that you say, We see, your guilt remains. They said we're perfect. The Pharisee says we have followed all along. We know everything. We have seen everything. We see everything. We, the, 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 we know how to follow the law. We know what the rules are. We know how to sacrifice. We know how to purify. We know what to do and what not to do on Sundays and the Sabbath. We've got it covered. We have seen and we've made our sacrifices. We are fine with all of that. And Jesus says, because you say you see, you are blind because you're missing the important details. You're missing the fact that, G that God says it's more than just doing all the right stuff and following all the rules and following every dot and tittle of the law. He says it's more than that. It's about following after Christ and putting God first. It's about putting God above everything else, not our religion, our God. Not the Word of God, but the God of the Word. If you were blind, then you would see. If you knew you were blind, and knew you were hurt, and knew you were broken, then you could be fixed. But because you say you're fixed, you're broken. And until you realize how much you need Christ and how much you are broken and how much you are blind and how much you are putting whatever is in front of you of over Christ and over your need for salvation, then you will be blind forever. So I don't know where you are. I don't know if any of this made any sense to you or if this is anything that's going to start. But the, 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 the call to Christ is to come and follow me. Be my disciple. Be my child. And he says, I love you. I love you. I love you. I will make you. I, I, I will make you see. I don't know if you have been a Christian, but you're not sharing your story. What did this guy do every time he's told his story? He told his story. He said it time and time again. Time and time again, every time they asked him, he told them the same story. That this guy, Jesus, he spit on my eyes, made some mud. I could see. He told the story time and time again. Nobody's going to believe me if I tell that story. Tell it anyway. Nobody's going to, they're going to doubt that I was that guy. Tell it anyway. They're going to nitpick all the details. Tell it anyway. They're going to want to argue theology and religion. Well, tell your story anyway and say, let's forget about the theology and religion. Let's talk about what God did in my life or what God is going to do in my life. Maybe the Pharisees decided to come to Christ. Maybe they decided to think eventually they got stupid and this is some of them in that room. Maybe they gave up on their religion started following after this Christ. Maybe they believed in Christ for the first time. Maybe not. But this guy did. And he told his story. Probably until the day he died. He told about it. And I wonder how many people believed in Christ. Because this man just told his story. And as Paul Harvey said, now you know the rest of the story. Father God, we thank you for this day. Lord Jesus, I pray for everyone who's heard this story, who took the time to listen. Father, I pray that you will speak to them, that you will share with them, that you will, that they will come and decide to follow you. Lord Jesus, we are blind that you made us see. God, your grace is so amazing. We love you and adore you. In Jesus' name.
Amen.